This is the Energy Education Podcast for Sunday, February 17th, 2013. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today's discussion is all about nuclear whistleblowers and the process they are sometimes forced to use when they call attention to problems within the industry. We'll talk about the alternative dispute resolution process. This is a process for nuclear industry workers who have been unfairly targeted or discriminated against to resolve their disputes. Frequently, nuclear whistleblowers find themselves in exactly that situation. Today, we'll be joined by David Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists to discuss the alternative dispute resolution process and hear some of his stories. All right. Today on the show, I'd like to welcome David Lockbaum. David Lockbaum is with the Union of Concerned Scientists. He's the Director of Safety Projects. David, welcome to the show. Hello, Kevin. And, of course, Arnie Gunderson, as always, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Dave. Hello, Arnie. Dave, I'd like to start with you. Today, we're talking about whistleblowers and the ADR process. Can you tell our listeners what exactly is the ADR process? The alternate dispute resolution or ADR process was instituted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about five or six years ago. It's a process where whistleblowers who've raised safety issues and have been retaliated or harassed by their management for doing so can seek to get their situation remedied if they've been laid off, if they've been denied a promotion, if they've been otherwise harmed for raising a safety issue, the whistleblowers and their companies can enter into an ADR process that's moderated by people out of Cornell University to try to reach reach some settlement, some arrangement where the problems of the past have been fixed. So David, how does that process work in reality? Well, in reality, the problem that the whistleblower fell into, whether it was loss in a job or or losing overtime or or some other harm for having raised a safety issue, at most is getting fixed. What happens when the NRC allows an ADR process to get started is that the NRC walks away. They don't investigate the underlying technical issues. If a settlement is reached, the company gets to do so scot-free. So the company could basically get rid of 100 whistleblowers a year and it doesn't show up anywhere in the NRC's books as being a problem, even though there's federal laws being violated. And also, the NRC doesn't go in and look at the technical issues to see if they've been fixed or not. So, David, if a whistleblower or a nuclear worker goes to the NRC, and then they are referred to the ADR process, um, how does that show up in the records? It, It really doesn't show up at all. It ends up being underneath the NRC's radar. Prior to the ADR process, if the NRC substantiated that whistleblowers had been retaliated against, which violates federal laws, if if the company had a pattern of that, more than one occurring, then the NRC would step in and issue a chilling effects letter that said, you've got a pattern of breaking federal laws here, what are you going to do to fix it, and the perception amongst the workforce that they can't raise safety issues. Under ADR, all that's hidden from both the workforce, the public, in the NRC, the companies can basically do away with whistleblowers at their, as a business decision, getting rid of them and the technical issues they raise. So if a whistleblower doesn't feel that the ADR process is satisfactory, does it go back to the NRC? That's correct. It, it stays under the old process where the NRC will send out the Office of Investigations to look into the charges that the company violated federal laws. If the Office of Investigation substantiates those claims, The NRC then can consider taking enforcement action against the company and also referring the case to the Department of Justice for uh, possible criminal sanctions. As an example of the ADR process, in 2007, uh, a worker at the Callaway nuclear plant in Missouri raised an issue and was uh, irritated his employer and employer took action against him for having raised that safety issue. The employee went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because his, he feel, felt that his employer had violated federal laws by retaliating against him. The ADR process was invoked. The company and the, this whistleblower reached an agreement. No action was taken against the company. The worker no longer works at the Callaway nuclear power plant. The underlying issue was never investigated by the NRC to see if the, the problems that the worker raised were ever fixed or not. 
So this worker raised concerns over a technical issue, but what you're saying is since he reached a settlement in the ADR process that that underlying technical issue was dropped and never actually investigated? It'd be like if somebody committed murder. Um, if, if, the person, if the murderer reached an agreement with the victim's family, bought him off, th then they would drop the charges and the state or the feds would never look into it. Um, that's not the way of the thing. If you, you can't kill somebody and get away with it, unless you're OJ. Basically, companies can make a decision. Is it cheaper for me to fix the safety problem or pay off the whistleblower and send him out the door? And that's not the way safety should be handled at America's nuclear power plants. So, of course, the problem was never really addressed. No. It's papered over, swept under the rug, and that rug is getting awful lumpy by now. On average, the NRC handles about five to ten of these cases a year. So that's five or ten nuclear safety problems not getting fixed each and every year. You know, the, the other piece of this is that if somebody's fired, they have no income. So even if they're legitimate safety concern, and it sure would be nice if the NRC knew about it, um, it's really, they really have no choice but to settle because their income is completely dried up. That's absolutely correct. I mean, the deck is all favors to companies. They hold the money, they have the benefit of time, and the NRC's aid and abetting, they're breaking the laws. Um, it's, it's a dire situation that's only getting worse. For an agency that claims to be as transparent as it is, it's amazing how much they hide behind the curtain. So what if we're talking about a worker who raises a safety concern? If you have just a, legit, a safety concern with no harassment or intimidation involved, then that goes into the NRC's allegation process where they'll, they seek to go out and answer that question within 180 days. Um, that's a somewhat tenuous schedule. We've had some that are almost two years old now. So apparently it's not 180 days in a row. Last year, two NRC staffers, Richard Perkins and Larry Crisone, raised concerns about how the NRC was dealing with flooding issues at the county plant in South Carolina and 32 other nuclear power plants in the United States. Perkins had authored a study of what the flooding hazard was, and the NRC had improperly withheld that from the public, was Perkins' claim. Perkins has gone to the NRC's inspector general, which is investigating whether the NRC withheld that information or not. Crisson also reviewed that report and was involved in that report, raised some concerns. He sent letters directly to Chairman McFarland and Senators Lieberman before he left office in Boxer. The, the NRC responded by investigating Larry Crisson for leaking information outside the agency rather than investigating whether it should have been withheld or not. It's uh, basically it's the attack the messenger or kill the messenger syndrome. Now, has Persone filed within the agency for some sort of protection? Larry Persone yet has not suffered any retaliation or discrimination, um, so he has not yet filed any action to prevent it. They're investigating him, um, they being the NRC's inspector general. There is concern that once the inspector general finish, finishes that investigation, that will be the grounds for terminating or disappointing. Larry has received a letter in his file warning him against distributing information outside the agency even though we provided Larry and his attorney with countless cases where other NRC employees did the same or worse without any sanction whatsoever. So he's being targeted uh, unnecessarily, and it's, it's the NRC at its absolute worst. Larry Cresson should be in the White House receiving some award from the president, not worrying about his job. Now, did these two whistleblowers also go through the ADR process? NRC doesn't have an ADR process for people who raise safety issues like this. In fact, when Larry Crisson sent the letter to Chairman McFarlane, they were a little bit perplexed about how to handle it because the NRC doesn't have a written process for how to deal with that, how to handle with an issue that somebody's raised to the chairman. Um, you'd think in some 30 years that it might have come up once before, but apparently not. Um, so they're still trying to figure out how to handle or respond to Larry's letter dated September 19, 2012. They haven't yet responded to his concerns. If you look more broadly at the NRC, every three years, the Inspector General surveys the NRC workforce for safety, culture, and climate issues. Last October, the latest survey was presented. The commission reviewed those results behind closed doors, which is safety culture 101. If you can't talk about it in public, you don't have a good safety culture. The results, when we obtained them, showed that there's a big gap 
between how senior managers at the NRC view issues and the workforce issues it. In fact, the, the consultant that does this survey said the gap at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is wider than they've ever seen in federal agencies or in the private sector. We take that to mean that if the NRC se senior managers don't see problems, they can't fix problems they don't see. And they have not rose-colored glasses, they have green-colored glasses. Everything looks great to them. So they don't fix problems in-house, they don't fix problems at a county, they don't fix fire protection problems at Browns Ferry, they just collect their paychecks. <laughs> In retirement. You know, in Maggie and my situation, uh, that was back in 1990, um, before there was uh, alternative dispute resolution. resolution. I um, found some safety problems, and I, I didn't go to the NRC. I went to the president of the company, and, you know, it's a senior VP. I thought he'd listen to me about these violations. And, uh, and instead, he fired me. I then went to the NRC, and, and I really believed the NRC would come riding in like, like uh, the cavalry and, and, and rescue me. And um, instead, the NRC started shooting at me too. They botched the audit um, and they didn't see any of the problems that I brought forward. Uh, so finally, I went to Congress and wrote to um, John Glenn and the uh, Government Oversight Committee. And there were congressional hearings that John Glenn fired up because he got the Inspector General involved. And the inspector general found that um, all the safety concerns that I had identified and then a couple more uh, actually did exist and that the NRC deliberately botched the inspection uh, basically because they didn't want to uh, chase all the paperwork required if they had found anything. And he also found that the uh, NRC um, was, was, taking, uh, was taking bribes from my employer. So that all came out in, in congressional uh, testimony. After that, I, I wrote to the NRC again through my attorney, and I said, you know, uh, you know Mr. Gunners is being sued here for a million and a half dollars, and we actually had the transcriptions from the president of the company. He said, he's suing me because I wrote to Congress. Well, the reason I wrote to Congress is because the NRC was corrupt and blew the inspection, um, and the NRC didn't lift a finger. Their comment was, well, that's a civil matter. If he's being sued, we can't do anything about it. But if you win your lawsuit, we'll, um, we'll think about doing something. And, uh, and, of course, six or seven years later with no income, uh, that became a moot point. So, you know, the old system didn't work, and now it seems like the new system doesn't work either. Arnie, when you say six or seven years later it became a moot point, what do you mean? Well, I blew the whistle in 1990, and... Uh, we uh, finally reached an out of court settlement with the with my employer at the end of 1996. Um, meanwhile, we were driven into bankruptcy. We lost our house through foreclosure, lost our retirement. Obviously, I wasn't going to get hired back in the nuclear industry again. So it was uh, uh, it was a devastating process. And and frankly, the out of court process, the out of court settlement, did not compensate us for what we had lost. Let alone anything moving forward but you know you have to get on with your life at some point and uh and, and it fundamentally altered the um uh the trajectory of my career and the trajectory of my life that's why we're running fair runs right now and i think uh, at the end of the day it's been uh, uh running fair runs has been rewarding incredible well dave have you had any experiences similar to this it, it's not Quite as uh, drastic an outcome as what Arnie and Maggie went through, but uh, when I was working in the nuclear industry, a colleague and I raised an issue, similar path to Arnie's, who raised it initially to the company who didn't want to do anything about it, took it to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Like Arnie, it was, we thought it was like calling in the cavalry, but instead Lauren Hardy showed up. That was a joke. We ended up going to Congress just like Arnie did to get that trickle-down effect where the Congress put some pressure on the NRC to finally do something to resolve the issue, and that, that led to my departure from the industry as well and move to UCS in what another colleague calls ethical cleansing. Ethics in the industry don't mix real well, so uh, the UCS job provided me a chance to still work on safety issues and not have to worry about a paycheck. I, I think a lot of people should be really grateful for the work you do at UCS State, I'll tell you that. I appreciate that, Arnie, and, and, and the work that you and Fairwinds and, and many others, Ray Shaddis and Jim Warren and many around the country has been a pleasant part of this job is to work with so many great colleagues around the country 
I get an awful lot of calls from people, workers at plants and staffers at the NRC uh, who want me to be the public face on their concerns so that the issue can be pursued without them jeopardizing their careers. And I, I'm glad to do that because too many people have been sacrificed on the nuclear altar. We don't need to do any more. So if I can work on an issue and protect their careers, uh, I'm glad to do so. Dave, listening to you as always uh, gives me goosebumps. My hat's off to Fairwinds for the work you're doing. I mean, if you go to YouTube and put in almost any nuclear t topic, Fairwinds comes out at you know four or five of the top ten slots on almost any issue, and I, I think that's a testament to the work you guys are doing. I'm glad to be part of it. Well, thank you, Dave. All right. Well, Dave, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Kevin. And Arnie, as always. Thanks, Kevin. And that does it for this week's edition of the show. You can join us back here next week for more discussion on what's happening in the world of nuclear news. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook. <laughs>